from ABC News Radio, KMET 1490 in Southern California. This is Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio with your host, Tyler Jorgensen. Welcome out to Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio. I'm your host, Tyler Jorgensen, and today we have coming to us a author, entrepreneur, speaker, and uh, general game changer, Jonas Sachs. Welcome out to the show. Thanks for having me, Tyler. It's great to be here. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Now, I've been doing a little bit of reading about you. I mean, we're going to talk about your new book, Unsafe Thinking, and how um, and the, the interviews and the things that you uncovered in preparing for that book. Uh, but as I was looking back in, in a lot of the stuff you've done, you've been running a storytelling digital marketing agency to really bring about like social awareness. And I realized that one of the, um, a, a video that really impacted me several years ago uh, is actually something that you'd work on called the story of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, that was such a cool thing. How, how did that happen? Um, you know, we had been experimenting since 1999, actually, with how you get people to take a message that they believe in and pass it along. And how do you take pretty boring social change messages and make dress them up so that people will want to share them? Um, and so that was before YouTube. It actually, Story of Stuff came out even before YouTube. So people weren't even necessarily sharing that much online. And this woman, Annie Leonard, came to us who was passionate about garbage, basically. And she's like, everyone needs to know where garbage comes from. And I've got an hour and a half talk about it. And we're like, yeah, no one's going to want to know for an hour and a half about their garbage. But, um, you know, we had a lot of theories that she also was kind of working on at the same time about how you turn to complex topics into stories. And when you do people kind of forget the complexity and the kind of boringness of it or the negativity of it. And they just engage if you do it right. So right. Uh, we turned that thing into a 20 minute lecture. It was actually one of the first uh, animated whiteboards, you know, that style became very popular after that. And, um, you know, we, we, we made it all about not the garbage, but about Annie's personal journey through shopping and styles and fashion and then garbage. And right. uh, we got like 30 million views in the first year it was out. And, uh, you know, people weren't even sure what it was because at the time, you know, Internet video was a novelty. Right. Um, but it showed me how important it is just to tell those compelling stories. You can have all the facts that you want. Uh, it doesn't do much, no matter how clear those facts are, until you really dress it up in a powerful story. So, yeah, and man, that's amazing. The, you said so many things in there that I would love to unpack, and we'll hit on a couple of them. But the, just the thing that you said, internet, at the time, internet videos were a novelty, right? And now it's like, not a, it's a necessity for any, any brand or any message that wants to get out there to be able to use videos and tell compelling stories, right? How, since that time in 1999, yeah. up until now, how have you seen, um, even though the mediums have changed or evolved or grown up, how has that core essential base of needing to be able to tell stories remain the same? And what's most important in that? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, I think in the early days, storytelling on the internet was more similar to what you might have seen in Mad Men or the old days of broadcast. You know, you really package up a message. You've got plenty of time to think about it. You maybe once a year, you make a really powerful video and that you hope that it spreads, you know? And like I said, sometimes we would get tens of millions of people watching these things. You know, sometimes we work for six months and we get 50 people watching them, you know, you, but you, you would craft that message and you tell that story. Now what's I think happening is just the ability to create so much media and our audience is being so overwhelmed by it. Um, you don't really want to go all in on a story like you used to. What you get to do is realize that the, the story is a, it's almost like a container. You get to define what the story is about as you know, think of your whole brand as a story and you start, these are the discussions and this is the chapters of the story we're trying to work on. This is the moral of the story we stand for, but you got to recognize that that story is going to be told over every channel, over thousands of conversations. It's going to be told by your audience members back to you and you don't just get to tell it with, you know, that one great 30 second spot. So um, in a way it's more crucial than ever in this world of noise and bifurcation that we um, come up with powerful stories, but it's more like it's a grand epic that's unfolding over every conversation we have, not a, uh, a single metaphorical perfect ad. So in many ways, that makes it even more important for a brand or a company to know their message because they've got to be telling it daily as opposed to just crafting it once and pushing play. Yeah. And, and if you don't know what your core story is, your core message really is about, 
you know, you're going to be chasing what, you know, Twitter wants at that given moment or what Facebook wants. And you're like, oh, we got 5,000 likes on this thing. Um, you got to be really careful though. Because if you're getting a lot of volume on something that really has nothing to do with your core message. I mean, for every like and click and view, you're not going to, you know, very small number of sales. If you're trying to create a, um, you know, a loyalty and a, and a connection with your brand, you can't just be going for volume. You've got to be going for authenticity. And so I think in some ways it's more important than ever to get that message straight because you're going to get, you're going to get distracted by all kinds of data points. Um, and you don't want to get too pulled. We've had a lot of, I've had a lot of projects where, you know, you do something that's hilarious and then everyone spreads, but nobody notices the brand. And you're like, oh, we shouldn't have done it that way, you know? Yeah, it's funny how often that happens. You see an amazing commercial and you're like, what was that even for? <laughs> yeah. you know? And it's like, it was good storytelling, but it wasn't, it, it forgot the meaning, the reason behind it all for the yeah. brand at least. Okay. So um, I think we could, I could dive down that road for a long time and I would love to talk more about it, but tell me and help me define unsafe thinking and let's go from there. Yeah, so unsafe thinking is the opposite of safe thinking. You know, it's when we want to change and we know we have to, but we just get pulled back in every circumstance to wanting to do what worked before, to those comfortable patterns, to, you know, de-risking. Unsafe thinking is that ability to break out of your patterns, to, you know, defy conventional wisdom, especially your own conventional wisdom, you know, because we just, we are creatures of habit who want to, you know, fall back on the lessons of the past. But the world is changing so quickly that we really have to challenge ourselves to change with it. And unsafe thinking is not just about going out and, you know, sort of saying to the world, no, I'm not doing it your way. It's, you know, saying to yourself, no, I'm not doing it my way. I'm doing it a whole new way and experimenting and trying new ways and using that whole brain. Um, we often let, leave parts of our, our psyche out of the picture because we get really good at one or two things. How do we expand and break those habits so that we're, you know, far more nimble? is the idea of unsafe thinking. Okay, cool. And so a lot of it comes down to even to challenging our own assumptions or our own, uh, you know, ideas that we had before we, when, when we started perhaps a project or a business or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, you interviewed a bunch of people and kind of used their stories uh, to kind of illustrate this point and people that maybe demonstrated unsafe thinking. Uh, give us an example. I mean, I'm looking at a few of them, but tell us about, you know, how unsafe thinking can help you you know, either bounce back from failure or, um, or take risk. Yeah. So, um, I interviewed for this book, uh, a woman named Julie Wainwright, and she is famous by for being the, uh, ultimate internet flop. She was the CEO of pets.com when uh, pets.com fell apart. You know, pets, pets.com was no worse than any other bubble business, you know, right at the turn of the turn of the millennium. But, they had that sock puppet that everyone knew and everyone found annoying and, you know, became the poster child for dot-com failure. On the same day that she had to close her business, her husband left her as well. And, you know, reporters were camping out on her lawn. It was this enormous failure that had such a deep imprint on her psyche. When I met her last year, she was running a billion dollar online consignment store uh, called The Real Real, which, uh, you know, most people haven't heard of, everyone's heard of pets.com, but right. she came back and failed twice more before building this business. And, you know, in understanding her story, it really comes down to the fact that the human brain is primed to take these deep emotional experiences and overlearn lessons from them. You know, success and failure is really based on a combination of our skills, our ability to learn, and then a lot of luck. Unfortunately, a lot of entrepreneurs will see these high emotionally impactful experiences, you know, a lost sale, a project that goes off the rail, a business that fails as a um, giant warning sign. You know, Wainwright didn't do that. She had lost everything, but she was able to then have a much more realistic assessment of her own skills and belief in herself to go and take yet another risk. And instead of learning the cautionary tale of the past, she actually pulled out the two or three things from that experience she knew could make her stronger. One of the ideas from the book and one of the big parts of unsafe thinking is that um, anxiety is a natural part of creation. And that if you are doing something that's not making you nervous, you're probably not being that creative. Every innovator feels anxiety. You can't, you just, there's nobody who's so brave that they go into this arena and they don't feel it. But the ones who tend to succeed are the ones who have reframed it as fuel for creativity. They move towards it rather than seeing it as a warning sign that they're getting off track. And so, you know, you really have to fight the natural impulses of your brain in a lot of ways to do all of this. Uh, partly because, you know, anxiety on the 
the African savanna where we, uh, you know, where we evolved was a sign that you had to run because there's probably a lion there. But in business, it's not like that. Anxiety is a sign that you're pushing into new territory. You shouldn't always do the thing that makes you anxious, but if you never do, you're probably trapped in safe thinking. Absolutely. That's, uh, I love that, that you said that entrepreneurs turn, uh, tend to overlearn, right? Meaning they take, they take something and they apply a, more meaning than needs to be applied to it. Uh, yeah. And so it's like, well, that didn't work in the past. Therefore, that can never work as opposed to what were the components that, sh- that were good? What were the components of that that were bad and what needs to be adjusted? Um, and and that, that, Julie's story is a phenomenal example. And what, what's interesting is, like you said, her new story may not be as well known or as mainstream, but it's highly, highly successful. Yeah. Uh, that, that lesson also doesn't just apply to our negative failures but it also applies to our successes. So um, if you can't overlearn from your failure, you also can't overlearn from the things that have worked. So there's all these studies of experts and uh, experts tend to, you know, have deeper knowledge, more experience, and also be more blind and wrong about the future. The more that they've attached their ego to that identity of experts. You know, one study I looked at studied 20,000 expert predictions over 20 years, they were worse than dart throwing monkeys. And the ones who were you know, the worst were the ones who were on TV the most and were being quoted in newspapers the most. And the reason for that, the researcher explained to me, was that, you know, you start to see everything in the environment as just a new flavor of an old problem. Oh, yeah, I've done that before. I've learned that lesson. I'm going to apply it here. And the world has changed. I mean, the world changes every, you know, <laughs> every month, it seems. Uh, so if we overlearn the less- lessons of our success, we start to think of ourselves as experts and we start becoming closed to the signals of the environment because our ego becomes so strongly attached to what we know. Uh, really, the learning happens when you jump into your areas of ignorance, not keep you know, talking about what you really know. So can you be an expert in unsafe thinking? <laughs> uh, so there's a, there's a uh, dynamic that I was exploring with that where, you know, there's this idea of the beginner's advantage. I think a lot of entrepreneurs love the beginner's advantage because yeah. I don't know anything about this industry and I don't have to, I'm going to come in and I'm going to disrupt it. Um, the reality is that people who make massive disruptions actually have quite a bit of skill. They have expertise. Uh, they understand what's been tried before. They understand the rules of the game. They, they get it, right? But they're not entrenched in one way of doing it. So they're passionate about learning. You get to a certain point of learning where you get more and more powerful at creating innovation. And then you can go over the U and you know, start going downhill into entrenchment. The trick seems to be to you know, passionately explore knowledge without ever believing you've attained it. So I call it being an explorer rather than being an expert. That's so you know, fantastic. Yeah. And, and, and you're right. Cause I think once, once we, you know, drank our own Kool-Aid or so to say, once we say I'm now the expert and that learning stops yeah. and that willingness to admit you're wrong stops, I think that's the beginning of, of the, uh, the descent, right? So, um, yeah, man, absolutely. I think, I think that's great. And I think be, being an explorer in this space is a, a great way to explain it, right? Both in, in exploring for knowledge and also exploring uh, what the next opportunities are. Yeah. Um, what are, who are some-